Hello, everybody. I'm early. I didn't have to run. This is progress. How is everybody? Woo! Awesome. I am Susan. I am your hostess for the evening. And I couldn't find my microphone, so thank God for Josh. It was hiding on my chair in plain sight. Might need some neon tape, Jay. Um, Would you guys pray with me? And again, short of breath, so give me a second. Heavenly Father, thank you for laughter. Thank you for friends that help you find things that are lost. Thank you for finding us when we're lost. Thank you for the opportunity to take a breath, sit in your presence, worship you in the best ways that we know how, because there are plenty of them. Um, And for just coming to recharge our batteries, I, I often say I don't know how I ever made it through a work week or a week without Wednesday night. So thank you for Wednesday nights. Thank you for our online family. Thank you for our in-person family. We are um, asking for blessings over those that aren't able to make it tonight, but we just ask for you to be with them. Lord, there are just people that are hurting and are tired and are searching and wanting to grow and wanting to stretch, and we bring all of that and lay it at your feet. We ask for your presence and your word to speak to us and we just want to say thanks for being awesome. Lord, we just lift up this service and just ask for you to tell us what it is that we need to hear and we just want to praise you with everything we have in Jesus' name. Amen.
surrender Grace for today is all that I need Surprised by your mercy it's new every morning Awaken my soul
have time My righteousness died for thee At my Savior's cross We're all sufficient married Did what I could not In love he It is 
done. It is time. to hear your word as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings Lord won't you bless them and use them Lord prepare our hearts our minds our ears Lord it's our desperate prayer tonight that for the next 40 minutes or so that we do our best to focus and to zero in on now the here and now everything else can wait its turn May we be receptive. Lord, bless the tithes, bless the offerings as we give them. May they strengthen the church. May they bless those in need. We love you. We praise you. Through the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Susan. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you'd like to give, there are some bowls in the front and the back. Watching online, there's a link for you there. Give as you feel led.
it up in here. Wow, right? So we're going to do some scripture. Let's hear God's word. Philippians 4, 10 through 13. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Y'all give each other hugs and say hi. God is good all the time. All the time. 
Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. Welcome to our CM campus. Before we start, I, I want to kind of let you know what's going on with the service itself. We are, you know, I've always said the best time for a church to do evangelism is when the church is aligned and hot. That's the best time. And we are aligned and hot. So guess what? We're going to do evangelism. So the first thing I want you to know is we are specifically inviting people to this service. Right outside on the table are some going deeper specific cards. Stick them in your purse. Stick them in your wallet. If God pings you to invite someone to this service, please do that. You're also, those of you that are on social media, you're also going to see an ad campaign for going deeper. Now, you've probably seen one for the whole church. That is everywhere. When you see those things, share them. Comment on them. Say, this is my church. Love to have you join me. That type of thing. So we are, we're just going to give God something to bless and see what God wants to do. That's what we're doing here. All right, so we are nearing the end of Philippians. Those of you that had a six-month over-under bet on it, I think you're going to lose. We're going to be under in fact, we only have two weeks left after tonight. It's time to consider what trail lies ahead for us. And the answer to that is going to be Colossians. Colossians explores a single question. Precisely how are we made right with God? In Colossians, Paul proclaims that we are made right with God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the work of Christ, our sins have been forgiven we are saved from an eternity apart from God, and our earthly lives are filled with purpose and passion and peace and power. So here's the big idea of Colossians. We're not saved by what we know, we're saved by who we know. I want you to hear that. We're not saved by what we know. We're saved by who we know, and who we know is Jesus Christ. I'm gonna call the series Reign of Freedom, and we're gonna see how giving everything to God is the only true path to a free life that being said we still have some ground to cover in philippians so let's crack on some years ago i was reading some material to prepare for a message i was going to give on marriage the author was citing sociological understandings that have contributed to the rise of divorce in recent decades and one of the things discussed was increased expectations for happiness. I didn't see that one coming. Increased expectations for happiness. Modern people expect to be happier than their ancestors were. Everybody expects to be happier. What's really interesting is when you drill down into it, people today are more miserable than any generation has ever been before them. But we expect to be really, really happy. Why? Well, maybe because we're financially able to hit the eject button. Maybe we're more psychologically willing. Maybe we're less inclined to think we're the problem and more inclined to think everyone else is. Maybe we're just inclined to run. Maybe we're just inclined to run. Some years ago, I was introduced to the relationship cycle. The theory is that all human relationships run in predictable cycles, and how we understand and navigate these cycles determines a lot of the quality of our life. So let's kind of take a look here at the life cycle of relationships, fusion. I just met the best person in the world, all right? Fusion. It's, it's boy meets girl and instant. This is the best person in the world. So that moves to confusion. After a while, you think, this isn't the best person in the world. This person is remarkably like all the other people in the world. So we go from fusion to confusion. Now we're in disenchantment. This person is not only the best person in the world, not only remarkably like the other people in the world, but it's quite possible this is the worst person in the world. Disenchantment. And then we have a choice. We either renegotiate 
and move through the relationship or we terminate and move out. All right? So disenchantment. At that point, we either terminate the relationship and move out or we renegotiate the relationship. Renegotiation says, I accept this person as they are and we will grow together and we'll work through this together. Termination is I'm gonna move on to another person. Either way, you always return to fusion. Either way. So if you terminate, you will return to fusion with another person because you will again meet the most wonderful person in the world. I guarantee it. It's kind of like looking for a truck. You will always find a deal you can't pass up. So termination will take you to fusion again, but renegotiation will also take you to fusion again. It's just it will take you there with the same person. I think it's why a lot of people kind of jump from relationship to relationship. They, they terminate at disenchantment. And then they just run the cycle all over again. Some people call it a failure to commit. I, I don't think so. I think it's a failure to renegotiate. I, I don't know it's a failure to commit. It's just when, when times get tough, they terminate. I remember a, a song, uh, Gillian Welch did it with Connor Albus, I think. But there was a line in it, and he said, I'm not a gamble. You can count on me to split. And, and you ever know anybody like that? They're not a gamble. You just know when times get tough, they're gone. I mean, there's, they're not a gamble. They're a sure thing. When the going gets tough, there'll be nowhere to be found. So termination, <laughs> then it loops back around to fusion with someone else. Renegotiation loops back to fusion with the same person. I think it's fair to say that people who have been married a long time fall in love over and over again because they work through this cycle over and over again. And that's what you learn when you have a marriage that goes on for decades. Now, I want to argue the same dynamic applies to jobs and friendships and you knew this was coming and churches so let's apply this to the church fusion I just found the best church in the world it is the best church in the world I have been looking for the perfect church bam I found the perfect church confusion this is not the perfect church <laughs> it's remarkably like my last church it's remarkably like all other churches this is not the perfect church disillusion disenchantment this might be the worst church in the world <laughs> this might be the worst church in the world i thought it was perfect then i thought it was average now it might be the worst ever and then where do we find ourselves? renegotiation or termination renegotiation i accept this church as they are and i will grow with the church or i will move on to another church i want to be very clear sometimes you need to move on to something else sometimes you have relationships and there are people in your life they need to be gone I'm just saying we shouldn't reach for that button too quickly. We shouldn't reach for that button too quickly. Sometimes people need to leave a church. They need a fresh start or they need an opportunity to use their gifts. And that's okay. That's okay. But we shouldn't hit the button too quickly. Either way, you're going to return to fusion. You will either find the perfect church again or you will renegotiate and find joy in your present church again. I want to suggest that people who have been in a church for decades have gone through this cycle probably many times. Some years ago, uh, I was in a situation where I had a very frank conversation with someone who was previously most enthusiastic about Christ Church, but came to tell me that they were now unbelievably unhappy and they were leaving. 
not considering leaving, they were leaving. Now, I knew something about their history, and I think it would be fair to call them a church hopper, right? You guys know what I mean? Kind of a church hopper. When they finally concluded the I am so disappointed with this church speech, I pointed out that they had cycled through several congregations in the area before they came to Christ Church. And I said, this might be your opportunity to grow up. And it might be your opportunity to mature in your faith. You can quit, and I assure you, you will find the next perfect church. And if you do, I would save this speech because you'll be giving it to your new pastor in two years. Or you can rethink this. You can renegotiate. You can adjust your attitude, decide to become an asset, and lean into what God's doing here. Guess what they did? They left and found another church. And they've been in two churches since. I hope they saved their speech. Many people navigate the relationship cycle. Sometimes we navigate several at once. That's when life gets a little complex. If you're, neg- if you're navigating your marriage and your friendships and your job and your church, that's when things can get a little weirded out on you. But we are always navigating this. And I think this is a really helpful tool for us to think about. And those of you that pick- took a phone picture of this, I think it was a great idea. This is a really helpful tool to help us think through just where we are. I think a lot of people today, modern people, think they only have two choices. Either get out of my present situation or be miserable for the rest of my natural life. I do. I think modern people have that as a dichotomy. So it's the choice in their mind is I either stay and live in absolute misery or or, uh, I leave entirely. And just try it next time, all over again. I just wonder if our emotionally bruised, relationally damaged, and institutionally scarred culture could possibly imagine a third option. Today, Paul is going to help us imagine a third option. Verse 10. I'm grateful for your concern about me and your gift to me. Roman prisons were holding cells. Deep in the Roman psyche, they didn't feel like people should get free room and board at state offense simply because they couldn't behave themselves. So if prisoners wanted luxuries, and to the Romans that would be enough food to live, enough clothing to keep them warm, and non-rat infested quarters, they had to arrange it on their own. Paul had endured significant hardship through the early part of this final incarceration, probably the rations, rats, and rags variety. But the Philippians had come to the rescue with an offering that made his life significantly more bearable. Additionally, the carrier of the offering was designated to stay in Rome indefinitely and care for Paul. So life for Paul had vastly improved because the Philippians heard a pain. Now, they could have said, we'll be praying for you. And that's great. It is, it's it's truly great. But when you tell people you're gonna be praying for them, you also need to be open to the pain. You gotta be open to the pain. I'm sure they started off praying for Paul. Let's all pray for Paul. And then I bet somebody said, you know, God's kind of laid on my heart. Maybe we could send him some money and, and help make his existence bearable. And then someone said, you know what? I, I, I'll give so much. And somebody said, well, I'll give so much. And before long, they had some money. And then somebody goes, who's going to take it? And then there was this guy. He said, I'm free. I don't, I don't seem to be tied up for the next two years. I, I'm free. And they said, okay, you take it. So the prayer led to the ping, and then when they heeded the ping, it reversed Paul's situation. When you pray, hang in for the ping. Don't stop praying 
before you get the ping. Lord, please help Paul. Help those rats not to eat his nose off. Amen. Let's go to Wild Wings. That's not what we're doing. We got to stick around in prayer. When you pray, stick around. Don't, don't exit your prayers too quickly. A lot of times we think prayer is talking. Prayer is actually supposed to be communicating. Have you ever had somebody that didn't understand you were supposed to be communicating? They thought they were just supposed to be talking? That's rough. That's rough. You know? Uh, when you pray, listen for the pain. Heed it. That's what the Philippians did. As Paul closes this letter, he, he thanks the church for not just caring, but for doing something about it, for not just praying, but heeding the ping. In the Greco-Roman world, friendship was really, really important, and it was about giving and receiving. It, it was a door that swung both ways. I, I think we've lost a little bit of that today. I want you to think about this. If you have a so-called friend who emotionally offers you absolutely nothing, ever, is that really a friend? Is that really a friend? It might be somebody you grew up with together, but is it really a friend? It might be somebody you went to college with, but is that really a friend? It might be somebody who lives in the neighborhood, but is that really a friend? But what if this person constantly hurts, frustrates, drains, and depletes you? The reality is that if one person in a relationship benefits at the expense of the other, that is not the definition of friendship. It's the definition of a parasite and a host. Paul had risked his life to start the church in Philippi. He'd personally mentored the leadership. He'd poured himself into them. He continued to serve as an apostle to the congregation. Paul had given to them in their spiritual need, and now they gave back to him in his physical need. A lot of people wonder, why, why, do, why does nobody do anything for me? And, and I often will ask, what have you ever done for anybody else? You know, I'm sure ticks often complain about the dogs. Boy, this dog's not very bloody. Man, I can't hardly get any blood at all out of this dog. I, I'm really serious here. Uh, Paul gave to them. They gave to him. I want to suggest that friendship is symbiotic. It's, it's a door that swings both ways. If, if you have a quote-unquote friend who gives nothing ever, and you give everything always, friendship? I don't think that's it. Family member, possibly? <laughs> friend, not a chance. Not a chance. Never take true friends for granted. A lot of people spend their whole life trying to impress people who don't care about them at the expense of the people who actually do. If you ever ignore a true friend to try to impress somebody who doesn't care about you, you, my friend, are an idiot. You talk about playing the short game. Play the long game. There will be a time in your life when all you have are your friends and the Lord. Do not take your friends for granted. Value them. Realize they are a gift from God. Give. Receive. That's what friendship is all about. Verse 11. Not that I was in need. <laughs> I thank you for helping me, but not that I was in need. Because I've learned to be content regardless of my circumstances. The Greek concept here is, is I've learned to be entirely self-sufficient regardless of my circumstances. It's a rich concept because contentment based on self-sufficiency was the highest aspiration of a Greek philosophical school and a Roman philosophical school called the Stoics. According to the teachings of Seneca, who is a contemporary, the ideal person was the human content with the least and who relied upon no one. 
We live in a culture that says the secret to contentment is found in having more. The Stoics would argue the secret to contentment is found in wanting less. An old man from my church in Georgia during my seminary years often told me, he that expecteth nothing will never be disappointed. He was a Stoic who drank sweet tea. The Stoics would have liked that guy. So I'm going to say this one more time. The Stoics believed the secret to contentment is not found in having more. It's found in wanting less. The Stoics additionally believed that the path to contentment was found in submitting all emotion to the force of human will. So it was mind over matter. Uh, Freud later is going to touch on that with this idea of a superego. It's, it's a mind over matter. It, it's being a strong minded. If you're a Star Trek fan, Vulcans are Stoics. They don't have great looking hairdos, but they are Stoics. <laughs> Mr. Spock is a particularly good Stoic. Stoics believe that everything happened, that happens in your life, was the will of the gods. And humans should accept both the best and the worst life has to offer without passion or emotion. If you are a St. Louis Cardinals fan, Paul Goldschmidt. Paul Goldschmidt. It's really difficult to tell if he hit a home run or struck out. Because he's just very, very level. Well, the Stoics would like Paul Goldschmidt. He would have been their very favorite baseball player. The people that hit a home run and jump up and down and go like this, the Stoics wouldn't have liked them at all. They would have been Epicureans. Stoics like you to keep it all under control, keep it in. Paul boldly states that faith in Christ, not Stoicism, is the best path to human contentment. It was a big, bold statement. He's arguing that the key to happiness and contentment is not found in mental discipline, lowered expectation, or self-sufficiency. It is found in total reliance upon Christ. The secret to human contentment is found in total reliance upon Christ. Now he's going to give an example. Verse 12, whether I am surrounded in luxury or poverty, full or starving, I have learned the secret of life. The Apostle Paul was always on the move. The only time Paul is not on the move is when God called him to stay somewhere for a while, like he did in Corinth, or he's incarcerated. Other than that, Paul is an object in motion. I think without any reservation, we could say that Paul walked over 10,000 miles in his life. Walked. He also rode ships. That didn't count. He walked. It was on the road that Paul spent probably 90% of his ministry was traveling. We don't think about that, do we? When we travel, travel is just something to get to where we're going. But for Paul, travel is something if you didn't redeem it, you're going to waste 95% of your life. So what did Paul do on the road? He mentored, he discipled, he poured into people, he invited people to travel with him. So I would say that if you traveled with Paul and you were welcome to do so, that it was a walking seminary. It was a walking seminary. Paul's accommodations on the road were either provided by people to whom he ministered, and they would have ranged from really lavish, like the home of Lydia, the seller of purple in Philippi, who was an unbelievably successful businesswoman, to the most humble of quarters, if he had quarters at all. So Paul, on one night, could literally be in a king's type environment, and the next night could be sleeping on the ground like a homeless man. That was just part of the rhythm of Paul. Since Paul had discovered the secret of life is found in submitting to the will of God, it really mattered little whether he was surrounded by wealth or poverty, as long as he was surrounded by God. So he took whatever was in front of him as God's will, and he gladly accepted God's will. He said that is the secret to contentment. 
And now we run headlong into one of the great single verses of the entire Bible. And some of you have been waiting to get here for a long time. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think the biggest misconception about this is that people sometimes think I can do all things in Jesus or through Jesus, but they don't understand in and through. A lot of people mistakenly believe that anything they want to do as long as they say, Jesus, that God is somehow obliged to make all their dreams come true. I want to be very clear. God is not a genie in a bottle. God is not your personal maid. God is not up there waiting for you to tell God what to do. That's just not how it works. It's just not how it works. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I played football in Duquoin, there were very little, uh, very little accolades then. I mean, nobody had walk-up songs or anything of the sort when I grew up, you know. <laughs> now, you know, a, a kid is, is like five years old playing baseball, right? They're there, they can barely swing the bat, and they got their finger up their nose, but by gosh, they've got a walk-up song, right? <laughs> they, got, they, got, they got their name on their back, they've got... They've got Equipment all over them. They got eye black on. You know, it's just, it's just, it wasn't like that when I was growing up at all. <laughs> at all. When I got to high school, it, it, it got a little bit more, but not much. I mean, you didn't, you didn't have your name on your back, that's for sure. Except on senior night, they would give you a jersey that had your name on the back and you wore it one time, and that was your last game you ever played. Incidentally, I was cleaning out my closet and I found my old football jersey. <laughs> Number 25. And it said, Bishop, guess what I did? I pulled it out and I put it on and I could not believe it still fits. <laughs> and then I remembered I used to wear shoulder pads. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> that was disappointing. <laughs> oh, well. When we would come out before games, we would uh, come out of, uh, of the training area, the locker room, and they would have a great big round thing with a paper thing on it, a big hoop, and, and then they would write stuff on it, you know, everybody's number and all that, and do coin Indians and all that. And one of the fun things you got to do was you got to run out, and everybody broke the paper, and then you ran through the hoop, right? And then everybody kind of clapped. And so it was, it was great. It was as good as God. I mean, we didn't have walk-up songs. So, this is as good as God. I can do all things through Christ. We had to run through the hoop. You didn't get to run around the hoop. You didn't get to go wherever fool you wanted. You ran through the stinking hoop. And I hate to think what would have happened to somebody that didn't run through the hoop, but I assure you they wouldn't have had to worry about being injured that day because they wouldn't have played. We ran through the hoop. I can do all things through Christ in the will of Christ as I abide in Christ as Christ leads me as I am in Christ and Christ is in me I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me not that I can do whatever I want and accomplish whatever I want as long as I say Jesus no you got to go through Christ through it a life that is submitted to God and marinated in the passionate love of Christ becomes a limitless life. If we learn to live through Christ, we embrace a limitless life. It's a life without a ceiling, and it's a life without walls. Because of the power of Christ in our lives, we can dream bigger, be happier, experience more peace, joy, fulfillment, and contentment than we ever imagined. But it is not found outside of Christ. It is found through Christ. When I was young, I was often described as confident by my friends and arrogant by my detractors. Both probably were true, but that was then, and this is now. These days, my confidence is based in Christ alone. Isn't it interesting how life has a way of humbling you, doesn't it? You know, we come up maybe thinking we're all that in a bag of chips and 
spend about four years with life kicking you with its boots on for long uh, for long you get a little different perspective get a little different perspective and I'm at a point in my life where my confidence is in Christ and Christ alone I, I got nothing other than that faith and arrogance are actually mutually exclusive Arrogance is an exaggerated sense of self-importance, and it's a soul danger. In fact, the Bible labels that as pride. Confidence in self is pride. No matter how intelligent, gifted, or creative you are, arrogance will always lower the ceiling on anything you might want to accomplish because you will never be through Christ. You'll always be trying to do things outside of the hoop in your own strength. Arrogant people... uh, will be limited in their relationships, in their careers, and in their spiritual lives by the smallness of their God because they are their own gods. If you are your own God, I just want to suggest to you, you have a pathetic little God. Pathetic little God. It's only when we place our entire faith and confidence in Christ that we can vanquish arrogance and begin to embrace the potential that comes through Christ. John Wesley wrote, I can do all things, even fulfill all the will of God. You know what John Wesley's saying? Through Christ, I can become everything God created me to be. Everything. Every bit of it. Through Christ. You want to memorize a great verse? I would work on Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but where where are we going to focus? Through. Through the hoop. Through the hoop, not outside the hoop. Not over the hoop, not under the hoop, not left of the hoop, not right of the hoop. Through the hoop. On your own, we will make a mess of our lives. Can I hear an amen from somebody? We will hurt people. We will break promises, and we will tear stuff up. We will tend to either stay in perpetual misery or live our lives on the run. But Jesus offers a third option. Through. Through. Not settling. Not running. Through. When Melissa and I first were married, I worked as a history teacher and a coach in Louisville, Illinois. We lived about a mile out of town on the Sailor Springs Road in the Little Wabash River floodplain. So you left town, go into Sailor Springs, and there was a bridge, and then there was a floodplain that ran for about, uh, gosh, almost a mile. And then we were on a little ridge above the floodplain. That was where we lived. House, gosh, uh, maybe the size of this stage. Maybe. The guy told me you could heat it with a candle when, when we rented it. He said, you can heat this house with a candle. And he was right. It had no insulation at all. And, and when it really heated nicely, it was in the summer. And so, uh, <laughs> and so uh, it was incredibly warm in the summer. But we lived in this, this tiny little house. I, I drove a blue 1969 Pontiac Le Mans. And you might say, man, that's kind of a muscle car. It was nothing like that. <laughs> nothing like that Uh, some friends gave it to us because we were young and we looked pathetic and so some friends gave it to us well one day Melissa and I had a particularly uh, bad argument and I decided I was done we've just had enough just done just done so I fired up the Le Mans floored the accelerator turned on the stereo I hate to tell you I remember what was playing. It was Boston. Uh, More than a feeling. (laughs) Turned it up to about 10. Rolled down the windows and just floored it. And I'm headed toward the bridge. I'm done. I'm just done. I wasn't even to the bridge yet when God spoke to me. And God said, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? I stopped the car 
and I turned off the stereo. And I just sat there. And I thought, I can't really go to mommy and daddy's, right? I really have nowhere to go. The line is pretty short on anybody that would want me coming their way. Uh, where am I going to go? So guess what I did? I turned around. And I went back home. And I told Melissa I was an idiot. And that was no surprise to her. <laughs> and we sat down. And we renegotiated. It was my first real attempt at exploring a third option. And it was also my first real attempt at being a big boy. People say to me, did you grow up in DuCoin? I said, no, I went to high school there. I grew up much later. <laughs> the third option. Not to be miserable for the rest of your life, not to run, but to go through Christ. Through Christ. Maybe, it's God, maybe tonight God is, is calling you out of an either-or dichotomy. And you came here tonight thinking, I'm either going to have to be miserable for the rest of my life, or I need to run. I want to suggest the possibility that there may be a third option through Christ. I want to invite you to refocus your attention from your misery on one hand and your inclination to run on the other I want to invite you to consider renegotiating and turn your eyes to Jesus for the solution maybe get down on your knees and pray and say Lord I, I don't have an answer for this I just hurt but I can't run. I got nowhere to go. I'm asking you to fully embrace the third option through Christ who strengthens you. I assure you, it's not found in a lesser life, nor is it found in running every time things get tough. It is a maturity found through Christ and Christ alone. And it's an invitation to grow up and be big boys and big girls. If you've 
then redeem Come sing the song forever to the Lamb And if you walk in freedom And if you bear His name Come sing the song forever to the Lamb We'll sing the song forever and amen In the angels cry Oh, holy All creation cry Oh, holy You are lifted high Oh, holy Oh, holy above them all All thrones and dominions All powers and positions Your name stands above them all Jesus, your name is the highest Your name is the greatest Your name stands above them all So I have to tell you the coolest thing ever sitting up in front is you can hear everything and hear your people sing holy. God is smiling right now because y'all were bringing it. Just saying. Um, will you pray with me? Whew. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this incredible message. Thank you for sometimes shoving on us a little bit, letting us know that we need to remember that we can have contentment in all circumstances at all times because of Jesus. We need reminders like that. The craziness of this world can distract and, and take us away from our focus on you. And nights like tonight just bring reminders that we don't have to strive and we don't have to um, try and earn anything because we have Jesus and that we can do all things through him not independent of him so thank you for that thank you for allowing us to praise your holy name and for I hope you're smiling because man the voices sounded really cool um, 
we love worshiping you, God. We love bringing our concerns to your feet, and we love the fact that you let us do that and that you continue to move us to where you want us. Help us to really absorb what we heard tonight. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to listen for the pings. Help us to be the people that you want us to be, Lord, to shine our precious Jesus to others. That's it. Just thank you, God. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for Jesus. In his precious and holy name, amen. Go in peace.